Do you ever ask yourself, am I playing too small? Have I left it too late to start afresh? Will I come to the end of my life and feel that I somehow let myself down? This is your invitation to hear from some amazing people who have asked themselves those very same questions and chose to wake the F up, to get off the hamster wheel of mediocrity and seize the life that was calling them. Be inspired and be challenged to discover who you have the potential to become and the contribution you're here to make. And now, here to guide you on the most important quest of your life is your host, Janet Hogan. My next guest is Whip Smart, and at just 33, has chalked up more runs on his success board than most high flyers twice his age. Perhaps it's to do with his eclectic upbringing, born in Hong Kong, raised in London, and now living between LA and New York. This citizen of the universe was a rising star on Wall Street at a time when it seemed there was no intersection between profit and purpose, when being socially conscious was something you never dared admit to who managed to save his soul by escaping the epicenter of success to chart his own path. And now to hear how it's been going for him, let me introduce you to Dominic Carms. Dom, welcome to Wake the F Up. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Well, that's my absolute pleasure. And I want to cut to the chase. What was so wrong with Wall Street that you decided to leave it at just 22? You know, give us your fly on the Wall Street, pardon the pun, insider's view. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, I never intended to, to, to end up on Wall Street. I went to school in New York City. Um, I did university and graduate studies in New York at NYU and Columbia University. And, you know, these schools are feeder schools to Wall Street. So what ended up happening is when I graduated from, I graduated a year early from my undergraduate uh, school. And um, everybody was like, well, go to work for Wall Street. And I was like, I'm not sure I want to do that, but okay, that sounds right. So I ended up at Citibank Smith Barney um, and I really didn't like it. So I decided that, okay, I'm, I'm going to pursue higher education. So I ended up uh, going to Columbia University and getting a master's degree. And as I was matriculating uh, out of my master's degree program, uh, I, I had the same dilemma. I, mean, I was like, well, now what? And everyone was like, go to Wall Street. So I was like, okay. So I ended up at HSBC um, doing asset um, management for brick markets, Brazil, Russia, India, China, when that was a big, when that was a big hot topic. And I didn't like that either. And I realized very quickly that um, a lot of people get pigeonholed into this sort of the Wall Street narrative just because of your geography or where you're located. And so I was one of those people. And before I knew it, I was, you know, putting on my suit, taking the subway to work, sitting under the halogen lighting, talking about playing golf on the weekends. And there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these things. But it absolutely wasn't for me. I mean, I do everything I can to avoid wearing a suit. So, uh, you know, and I was wrestling with the, the meaning of what I was doing. You know, every day I was coming to the office and pushing around a bunch of buttons on a screen. I didn't understand what they were doing. I fundamentally didn't um, necessarily agree with a lot of the uh, symbolic nature of what Wall Street stands for in a, lo a lot of areas. And so I ended up, you know, incredibly frustrated and yearning to do something that was more impactful in the world. And so uh, I was presented with a really interesting choice, actually. Um, I was entered into uh, effectively this global managers program um, at a, one of the big banks. And uh, it was a very prestigious thing at the time. And they came and said, hey, we've nominated you and you'll do a stint in this country and that country. And, and it's part of our year of um, you know, bringing young up and comers in the bank. And um, I called my father and I remember I told him about it. And, he, and it was more money than I'd ever seen in my life before. I was incredibly excited just nominally the prospect of what this meant. And, um, and yet I was like absolutely dreading accepting the offer. And I called my father and he was like, well, you got to do it. And, uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I know. And I took every ounce of my, uh, self control, so to speak, to come back and just, I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry. And I ended up taking a job after that, that literally paid me almost minimum wage. Um, I was, I became a writer at a think tank. Um, talk about, I mean, a, a, a job where there's no love lost. <laughs> so it was just, I was, it was fascinating. I loved the work that I was doing. Um, and then I eventually made my way into international politics and, and diplomacy from there. But, you know, uh, extraordinary opportunity. And I, I think I made the right decision. So for me, that was the journey, you know, into Wall Street and very quickly out of Wall Street. Yeah. What did you learn from that? I mean, you know, often we can look back on our life, you know, and, uh, you know, imagine sliding doors. What if I uh, stuck with it? 
What did what lesson did that experience in Wall Street uh, give you, Dom? You know, I had a I, I won't say who it is, but I had a car. I was one of the earliest days at the bank. I was sitting in one of the big banks. I was uh, at lunch, and I had didn't know anybody at the bank. And I sat down with one of the new team members who I had met, and he had been there for ten years or something. We were talking, and he said, um, "I said, so tell me, what do you do at the bank?" And he said, "Oh, I design the PowerPoint presentations for the bank." like the gra- he's like a graphic designer. And I said, Oh, that's interesting. And he said, I said, how'd you get into this? And he said, well, I always actually wanted to be a cartoonist. I, I was obsessed with cartoons. I wanted to draw cartoons. I wanted to create the next SpongeBob. I wanted to create the next Rugrats, Doug funny, what, whatever it is. And I tried to do it, but it was just impossible. And so I started working at the bank because it was good money. And before I knew it, I would have been here for 10 years. I have a wife and kids now. It's yeah, I can't quit. I mean, it's literally the cliche that we see in the movies. And it sent an actual shiver up my spine. I, I sat up really quickly and I thought, I got to get out of this place. And, mm. you know, there's, again, like I'm not making a moral judgment on the banks one way or another, but the lesson that I learned is that life is too damn short to be doing something you don't like every day. And everybody's going to have their own passions. And yeah. in the course of my life, I've met very few people who say, you know what I really want to do? I really want to go and sit and push around a bunch of buttons on the screen that I don't fully understand what they do. <laughs> yeah, almost nobody says that. Right? So I would say, you know, the banks can be a great opportunity. They're a means to an end. I have nothing fundamentally against Wall Street if that's where you want to make your career. But for me, it wasn't the right choice. And I think you have to pursue your passion at all costs. Well, it's wonderful when you can learn that at an early age. And I think, um, you know, that's that's kind of a little miracle because it's almost like if we follow the conventional life stages, you're not supposed to have that wake up call too much later, Dom, just in case you didn't realize. <laughs> but, you know, we do get swept along by what's expected of us. And it sounds like, you know, that, that friend you were talking to, suddenly then he was married, suddenly he had mouths to feed. And so he didn't have any choice, actually. He was on his railroad track to... Uh, well, let's call it a life of quite despair because that's what it is in no uncertain terms. That little flame that you talk about, that feeling of I can't do this, that doesn't go away. <laughs> that, that only yeah. gets louder and louder. Um, so, yeah. so you really did have that red pill, blue pill moment at a time when, you know, the stakes were very high. Um, by the way, what did your dad yeah. say after you made your decision? How, how did that affect your relationship with him? I mean, my father's incredibly supportive. Um, and now we even, you know, we work together in some capacity. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say that he, you know, blew up and got all upset with me, but he was shocked. I think he was shocked. You know, I had come out of graduate school. I had never, you know, made a t- I was young. I was in my, uh, I guess at the time I was like 24 and I had never made a ton of money. I mean, what, you know, it's 24 years old and, um, all of a sudden this bank is throwing, you know, six figure checks at me. And, um, I remember at the time I had a girlfriend and I had just uh, gotten my first paycheck from the bank and I went out and bought a hearse and jewelry and with, with the, with the paycheck, I had no idea what I was doing financially, of course. And, um, I, I felt so good about being able to do that. And I just remember thinking of all these different calculations about, I'm not going to lose the ability to provide for my girlfriend and my, my father's going to be disappointed and I'm never going to have a career and, and everyone I know works in banking. And so, you know, I think he was surprised, but ultimately incredibly supportive and said, you know, I'm here to support you. I'm here to help you. And Quite frankly, I realized that in hindsight, I realized not everybody can make the decision that I made. You need that supportive infrastructure. You need family members who are supportive. You need a basic financial base to be able to make those types of decisions. And I'm aware of that. So uh, yeah. it was a very interesting experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you chose the, the it sounds by, by all, um, by the sounds of it, that you chose the right colored pill. So uh, speak to us now on the other side of the fence. What are you doing now? Tell us about that. Yeah. So I, you know, I spent a while in international affairs, um, working on Capitol Hill and United Nations, fascinating experience in both places, really got to see how diplomacy and politics work. Um, and then I eventually decided that, you know, what I was passionate about was the intersection of profit and purpose. You know, I was presented with a very clear binary when I graduated from graduate school, it was like, go be a do-gooder, make very little money, but go and save the world, you know, and work in a nonprofit or, you know, sell your soul and be a capitalist, but you can make a lot of money. And it was bizarre because that's not the way my, I'm a millennial and that's not the way our generation was raised and certainly not the preceding, you know, the, the succeeding generation. So 
I was kind of caught off guard by this like, very strong binary that it represented to me. And I, I hated the idea of choosing one or the others. So mm. eventually I became obsessed with finding profit and purpose. And that's really where I became an entrepreneur, but particularly an entrepreneur that focuses on what I call Philtech, philanthropy technology. And so what I do is I build venture backed companies in the philanthropic space that are addressing inefficiencies in the largest underserved sector of finance today, which is the half a trillion dollar annual donor market in the United States. So total donations to US-based nonprofits last year in the United States were $471 billion. One out of 10 Americans work for a nonprofit. 72% of Americans donate to a nonprofit. Uh, uh, the philanthropic industry accounts for about two, two and a half percent of US GDP. The nonprofits hold over $3.5 trillion worth of assets. It is a massive, massive, massive industry. And it is horrible inefficiencies. The industry is completely inefficient because the large companies, large fintech companies and VCs hear the word nonprofit and they take it literally. Well, the reality is if you perform a service in any market and you perform it well, you can make a tremendous amount of profit and you can do good in the world. There's a positive externality for what you're doing. And I think there's nothing better than that. So I've devoted the last almost 10 years of my life and my career, and I'll devote the rest of my career to finding inefficiencies in this marketplace and using technology to fix those inefficiencies at the same time returning capital to our investors. And so I'm currently on my third venture. It's a company called You Pledge. And you know, I can't get into too much detail because we're not live yet, but basically um, we have created the first ever proprietary philanthropic credit product, which allows people to um, essentially donate to nonprofits on credit without coming out of uh, pocket any cash at the point of donation. Um, and the nonprofit still receives the funds and the donor gets the gross tax deductible receipt upfront. So it's extremely unique. Um, again, it's a venture backed company. We're backed by, you know, some of the major uh, VCs and, and investors in the fintech world. We have an incredible opportunity to unlock billions and billions of dollars of additional liquidity without stressing the donor's checkbook. And that liquidity ultimately means more impact, means more money to more nonprofits to do more good in the world. Uh, so it's, it's an incredibly impactful product. Yeah. I'm just thinking about that term. It, it sound, just sounds so exciting and it sounds like you're solving a major uh, problem to open up more funds to come through. But that term non-profit, it's really an accounting term, isn't it? You really need a consumer term, don't you? I mean, I wonder if it needs a rebrand, you know, like uh, uh, purposeful profit or something. You know, this is a purposeful profit company. <laughs> but, it, so it, it has a bad connotation. Yeah. yeah it, 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 has a, it has a bad connotation. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely and, agree. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the language, I agree, it's kind of been typecast by do-gooders who have no money sense, and that's not what you want to get across, you know. So, yeah, maybe you can instigate, this is the marketing person speaking here, Don, maybe you can instigate a bit of a brand change so that the whole perception of the space, or it's even almost like a new space, you know, uh, but it's the same thing. But with a, a That'd be great. Don. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's because yeah. pe people, you know, you're talking to um, – you know, there's a, I'm just thinking my own generation, I'm a baby boomer, and uh, in, to some degree, uh, you know, we've been told oh, we created the problem. I don't agree with that. I think the problem's been in the making since the Industrial Revolution. It's been, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pot that's been slowly boiling. It's very close to coming to the boil now. But I do think also that we have our contribution to make, and we must, absolutely. And one way, of course, is through investment, you know, so to be able to repackage it to these uh, future in, investment um, markets is, is obviously important. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's so, I'm very mindful, you know, I live in Bali and I, and I see a lot of people come over here with savior syndrome and, you know, speak from the mountaintop about how evolved they are. And when we start talking about the moral space or even the word purpose, it's, you know, a lot of people get triggered by that, but I'd love to hear, cause you have such a pragmatic approach to what you do. I'd love to hear how you define, you know, morality in your sense, you know, say, uh, you know, so many, so many of us live by the Ten Commandments. What would you say were your top three commandments to yourself? You know, the the values, if you like, that you feel are important to uphold, so you don't slip back ever into that Wall Street mentality. Well, you know, to be very pragmatic, you know, Edward Carr, the theorist, said morality is the product of power. So it, it's a very um, cold way to look at things, but those who are in power dictate the moral prisms of all of us in some sense. Right. So, um, we may not agree. We may all not agree with the laws in our society, 
society, but collectively we have chosen to empower certain people. And those people have made a series of laws who I imagine would argue the laws are, are somewhat moral. Otherwise, what is the basis for following them? Um, I don't know. You know, so I think, I think at, at its, at its most basic sense, that is true. You know, morality is the product of power. Those who are in power have the, uh, I think they have the, the self-imposed belief that they can impose their moral beliefs on the rest of us. And for the most part, they're correct. You know, we, we accept that. Um, now, you know, there are two ways to look at this morality. Some people think morality is the result of some higher being natural law in the universe, if you will, like a pantheistic approach. And other people think morality is a legal positivist approach, which is that morality is what comes out of the legislator basically um, in legislation and so forth. I, I, you know, I tend to believe that um, in this idea of sort of, it's a Latin phrase, but use Kogans, which is this idea that there are certain unbreakable rules of being a human being. And that forms the basis of what we consider to be our human morality. So I don't think that if you put a child in a box and raised it for 30 years uh, without ever seeing the outside world, and then the child came out or as an adult, and, you know, I don't think you would need to teach that adult that killing someone is wrong. I don't I, I think there is something natural in us that would know such a thing. So, um, you know, that's how I view it. I do think we have a universal set of moral principles, which is why I don't buy this idea of like cultural exceptionalism that like, oh, we shouldn't criticize this. We shouldn't criticize that. No, no. The reality is we all know right and wrong at a basic level. Um, and so for me, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. What are my three basic morals? Um I have my own moral principles and for the, you know, I cannot violate those because if I violate those, I start to feel really, really bad. I start to feel um, like I'm doing something wrong. I start to feel guilty. I start to feel out of my equilibrium. And ultimately what ends up happening is I don't perform as well. I don't sleep as well and I can't operate. And so for me, you know, I've, I try as hard as I can and anyone who knows me would tell you this to be as ethical as I can be at all times. And, um, that's based on my own personal ethics, but also what I believe is this like fundamental set of human values. So that's basically the best answer I can give you. Yeah. Do you, um, what about the, this word purpose that um, we're now aligning with the concept of profit and it's kind of weird to think it's such a new concept, right? And we, it's, we're, we're still finding our way with it. How would you define purpose in the corporate context that you're talking about? Well, I will say just at an outset, I, you know, profit is not immoral. It's more amoral unless it's done at the expense of other people or, or other values. Right. So being profitable ha has gotten a really bad connotation. There's nothing wrong with being profitable. If you're exploiting other people, then there's something wrong, but profitable being profitable is an amoral term. It's, it's neither good nor bad. Um, so it's very subjective, right? Being profitable is good for the person who's making them profits, I suppose. Um, purpose is, is extremely subjective because everybody has a different purpose. I guarantee you that everyone who's listening to this has a completely different sense of purpose about themselves than, than I have about me and you have about yourself. So I would say purpose is a subjective understanding of what your um, motivation is for getting up every day and what you're trying to do with your life. Um, and it's, it's completely subjective. And that's why I would basically define it. Yeah. Cause it's interesting. Uh, I'll ask you that in a moment, what gets you, what gets you out of bed, but, uh, for instance, your purpose, although it sounds very um, uh, worthy, uh, you know, to give space and funds and time and energy to, you know, worthy companies, but your purpose could be finding solutions or niches in the market, you know, problem solving. And it's uh, and the, the area that you're working in is simply the context, but uh, it doesn't really speak to your purpose. So I suppose this is where I'm getting to my definition of purpose, which I feel is to be true to ourselves, you know, in an act of divine selfishness to, to understand what it is that is the gift that we've been given and how to put that to best use. You know, how can we best leverage that so it has the maximum amount of impact? And um, when I, yeah, when I, when I hear you speaking, I, I hear someone who's, uh, you know, obviously very good at what you do, and, uh, you know, you had your, your, your quick uh, ascension to success uh, on a, on a values basis, something didn't align that was, you know, uh, spoke to you loudly enough that you had that red pill, blue pill moment and chose the way you did, but your purpose could be something quite different from that. You know, whatever it is, that is your gift. What, what do you feel is your gift? What's the thing that you've been blessed with, Dom? Well, I'll say at the age of 33, I don't know what my purpose is yet. 
uh, I know what I like to do and I know what I'm passionate about, but I don't know if that's necessarily my purpose in life. I think, uh, you know, hopefully many, many years from now, if I look back on my life, I, I, I've had different phases of my life that have led me ultimately somewhere to my ultimate purpose. But um, yeah, so, so, you know, I don't know hundred percent what my purpose is yet. Um, but I think what my gift could be, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I think different, if you ask people who know me, different people would say different things, but I think my gift might be the ability to um, analyze a problem understand, uh, you know, what the problem is and what the potential solutions are and put that into motion fairly quickly and get to an MVP, a minimum viable product that addresses that problem. Am I the greatest CEO in the world? No, I'm not. Am I the greatest entrepreneur in the world? No, I'm not. Um, am I very good at getting a, 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 a product to its MVP? and the, the, the fundamentally solves a problem and then scaling it from there. Yeah, that's what I would yeah. like to think I'm good at. Yeah, I agree. Well, just hearing you talk, I agree. That definitely seems to be what your gift is and your purpose is just to get it out there. That, that's your purpose, just to share it. Um, and, and this is where yeah. your, you know, your values, which are different, of course, define the context. Um, so according to your values, it was never going to be Wall Street, but what that's opened up for you is this okay. exciting new realm that hasn't been really properly developed. It's really in its infancy, isn't it? And so, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very exciting time for you to be sharing your particular gift to put it out there because uh, the world needs it. <laughs> the world needs it right now. We're, we're slowly turning the Titanic around. The clock's ticking very loud. It's, um, it's almost <laughs> like, um, you know, if you're a woman, you're used to the expression biological clock. Um, ticking. And now I think uh, whether you're male, female or whatever, it's now a spiritual clock or it's a clock of meaning or something else that's, that speaks to a, a different part of ourselves that we previously didn't even admit to owning up to having a conversation with, you know, something that um, when we get to that moment at the end of our life will be the difference between, yeah, do I have regrets? Did I let myself down? Did I let others down? Or is it a sigh of relief? Oh, you know, my life did have some point nice. to it. Yeah. So, yep. um, so um, um, I just wanted to uh, ask you, once you made that move, because um, the purpose of Wake the F Up, the podcast, is really speaking to that moment, which it seems you had very young, of making that decision. It was almost like a life death decision, isn't it? Because it is death on one hand, you know, it's death to things that you believe in, that your parents believe in, that you've been brought up to believe in all your life. Yeah. You have to shelve that belief. It's, it's death on a metaphysical level, let's say. And now you're going, okay, uh, now I'm going to shoot down this road instead. And I have no idea that what it's, how it's going to turn out. I just do know that if I don't go down this road, it's not going to end well, you know? So it's, uh, uh, it's the opposite to better yeah. the devil, you know, basically. Uh, maybe it's uh, better the God you don't know. Maybe that's what it is. But um, what yeah. about after that? What about after you went down that path? Uh, what were the what were the struggles? What were uh, what were the things that you had to contend with that maybe you weren't expecting? I was shocked by the level of um, cynicism and. Um, I wouldn't say, I don't want to go so far as to say corruption, but cynicism and um, narcissism in our politics. You know, I went into politics believing, funda I was that naive guy who believed like, oh, I'm here to do the people's work. You know, I'm here to do the people's work. At the UN, that's what I thought. On Capitol Hill, that's what I thought. Like, I was there for that reason. And although I was there for a brief time, I saw the reality of what it really means to be in politics in America. And um, it's extremely depressing. Um, the people, you know, running this country by and large are, are uh, not in it for the right reasons, a lot of them. Uh, there's not a lot of actual work being done in Congress. Most of the work that gets done is done by interns and, you know, people getting paid minimum wage, basically. And most of the senators and congressmen spend most of their time fundraising. It's an open secret in Washington, D.C. And, um, it's, you know, we have a lot of problems in this country and, uh, you know, that was extremely hard to, to see and extremely, um, debilitating really to, to have your sort of your whole worldview smashed like that at the, at the yeah. young age that I was. So, 
you know, that, you know, that, that was the hardest thing. It was honestly the cynicism and the narcissism. And then funny enough, I sort of, you know, I, I realized, okay, so politics is, is not the right place for me because I'm too naive. But then I went into business still being with that naivete, but just in a different sense of, Oh, business is going to be different. We're here to make money. We're here to get along. We're here to be team members. And you realize very quickly that business is it just as cut, you know, business at, at the highest levels is just as cutthroat as politics. Um, even more so in some sense, I mean, at least in politics, they pretend to care about the world. They pretend to care about the masses, but in business it's, you know, profit, 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 profit. And a lot of people have this consequentialist idea of the ends justify the means, right? The, the, it's, it's a the consequentialism is a brand of philosophy that says the ends justify the means. And a lot of people uh, go into business thinking that. And so they operate, you know, the, the most overused trite and ridiculous phrase ever invented in the history of mankind is, oh, it's not personal, but and then you do something deeply immoral. So, you know, when people say it's not personal, it's just business, um, you know, that I think there's a misunderstanding. People use that as carte blanche to then do something terrible. Well, it's just business. It's just business. It's not personal. It's just business. So I'm going to screw you over. Well, okay. I mean, <laughs> just because it's just business, that doesn't mean it gives you carte blanche to act, you know, uh, and do something horrible to somebody else and, you know, entirely immoral. So, I think I was for a second time and, you know, shame on me, I suppose, shocked by the, the same type of dynamics in the business community. Um, and, you know, even though I've been doing this now for 10 years, there's still moments where somebody does something or says something. And I'm like, wow, you know, like unbelievable. I can't, I can't understand how that is acceptable. And um, yeah, that was the hardest thing is just having my, my naivete shattered by the reality of the world that we live in. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, shattered, but uh, you're still there. Uh, you're still reinventing. Uh, well, the, the reality is, is mutating as we speak, isn't it? Uh, it almost is like a fluid thing. All bets are off now. Uh, everyone goes, yeah, the system's broken. Even the most conservative person will say that, you know, that things are changing, whether we like it or not. What scares you most about the world, Don, um, at, at the age, you're 33 now, right? So at your age, yep. what, when you look towards the future, what scares you most? Uh, I mean, hands down, it's our inability to solve any real problems. I mean, you know, if you look at a president, I mean, I, you know, I encourage you, you and your listeners to do this exercise. The next presidential election that comes up, listen to what the candidates talk about, listen to the issues they talk about, and then pull a tape from 1964, and listen to the issues that are discussed, basically going to hear the same thing. Okay. You're talking about 60 years ago now, and you're going to hear the same nonsense again and again and again. We got to fix our immigration system. We got to fix our healthcare system. We got to fix our infrastructure system. We got to take care of our veterans. Nothing has been solved in 60 years, at least in this country. I'm, I'm talking now about the United States. I love, you know, this country. I am an immigrant to this country. Um, grew up most of my life here, but you know, that, that is very scary because we have seriously uh, big problems here. And, you know, so as, as goes America, as goes the world, I mean, we're 4% of the world's population, but we occupy an outsized, you know, influence on culturally how the world operates, certainly financially, militarily. I mean, the United States has a huge effect on the world politically, obviously. And so I worry that our inability to fundamentally solve any, any problems, even the most basic problem. I mean, you know, home, you know, let's just take a simple example. Um, homelessness. Homelessness is, I live in California. Homelessness is out of control here. Absolutely out of control. You know, it's not that expensive to fix homelessness. We spent trillions of dollars in Afghanistan uh, to try to fix Afghanistan. If we would have spent one tenth, one twentieth, one thirtieth of that money in the United States trying to fix some basic problems that we have here, like homelessness, you could, you could eradicate homelessness in the United States. I mean, the estimates are out there. You can absolutely eradicate it. It's like $30 billion a year would you know, would be the investment. Jeffrey Sachs said with a couple hundred billion dollars a year, you could eradicate global poverty, climate change. The, the IPCC on climate change, international panel on climate change said that I think it's around eight to $13 trillion. You could solve quote unquote, solve climate change. It sounds like a lot of money when you think the global economy is $80 trillion plus it's not that much money to save the planet and our home. So the, what really upsets me and I made a speech at the United Nations about this subject, by the way, is that the problems that we have today are eminently solvable. 
We know how to solve them. It's not, it's not some secret sauce that we can't solve. We just don't do it. We just, yeah. we just don't do it. And it, it really upsets me. <laughs> yeah. And we talk about, you know, we say, oh, that's a capitalistic system. It's broken. It's actually not. It's that capitalism is a good way to make profit. Right. Um, you know, is it, it's what we're talking about, the shadow side of the meritocracy, you know, where we've put into a hallowed space our ability to be rewarded according to our natural talent. Therefore, someone who's lying in the street must not be worthy under that, you know, under that way of reading the world. Um, yeah. it, it's something yeah. that, that really struck me as an Australian, actually, because we have the opposite to meritocracy. We've got, you probably heard about it, the tall poppy syndrome. So the minute anyone seems to excel in a particular area, we, we chop their heads off yeah. like the poppy head. But equally, yeah. uh, nothing shocks me more than going to America and, like you said, seeing all these homeless people in the street. So we don't have that. I mean, we do have it to some degree, but not, not endemic like it is in the States. And it's just uh, so in your face, you know, the, the problems. But there's a blindness that goes with that where people just walk past and don't see it. Um, it's in, it's absolutely yeah. insane. It's absolutely yeah. insane, yeah. by the way. <laughs> it, it is. I, I totally insane. agree. Yeah, no, we, we're turning into a bunch of zombies. Um, so the um, it's interesting because the point you've raised is that the problems are not the problem. <laughs> it's, and it's no, not, they're not at all. No, the problems are not the problem, nor is our inability to solve them. It's our lack of will to solve them that is the problem. And that's it's, it's, our, it's, our, yeah. it's, it's a lack of will and it's also a misalignment of incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it's, you know, it's a misalignment of incentives. It's a lack of will. And it's that society is really not set up to solve all the problems because a lot of people make a lot of money off the problems being there. You know, it's the idea of, you know, let's just take a pharmaceutical company, for example, let's just, you know, and, and, you know, I'm going to not name a specific one, but, you know, their calculation is, does it make sense to cure this disease? Okay. Or does it make sense to treat this disease where we can make, you know, $10 billion a year for the rest of our lives treating this disease? Well, I mean, if you're just thinking purely of the profits, it makes much more sense to treat the disease, much more sense. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe that, you know, there's cures out there for all these terrible diseases and there's, you know, it, you know, men in white, you know, black coats sitting in a room and hatching these evil plants. I don't believe that. But if you're talking about the, just the incentive structure, you know, the incentives are misaligned and it's the same thing with politics. I mean, people who actually solve problems don't get elected to government no. because, because if the people that are going to go on cable news and call their enemies, idiots and assholes and all the other things that they say, you're going to get ratings on the cable news agency, you know, channels, and then they get, you know, elected because they get name brand recognition and so forth. So it, the, the system is just not really aligned to actually solve the problems. That's the reality. And I don't know, I don't know if there's an, a fix for it, but it's it's very depressing. <laughs> okay, um, it is right now, yeah. Um, if we look at the lack of wanting to change the problem, you know, that, that lack of will, because it works against the very nature of why we're here, which is to make money. This, you know, I'm talking about the old credo, which seems to be going through a bit of a metamorphosis right now. But let's talk generationally, you know, that, that that was definitely our credo. You know, the more money I make, the happier I'll be. Um, and the harder I work, the more money I make, the happier I'll be. We, never mind that we're working at something that we hate, that is an absolute sacrifice, nose, nose to grindstone. That was seen as worthy. Okay, those values sucked. We know that. We know that doesn't work. Uh, what's encouraging is how recently those values were our prime values and already you can see them shifting. So that's the baby boomer mindset. Then we have the millennial mindset and you're, so you're a millennial and you're seeing, you know, uh, you're seeing that there's got to be a better way. You understand uh, that that system was broken and, and so many millennials suffered firsthand, probably my children included, because the parents were always working and, you know, buying things to make up for the love that wasn't being showered every day. I'm not getting into a self-guilt um, rave here, by the way, but, th but these are real things. You know, this is kind of how we live. This is yeah, our, they are. These are our values. Um, what do you think about the next generation coming through, the Gen Zs? Do you think that uh, their desire to change the world is the idealism of youth? Or do you think it's possible that a generation could actually have at their very heart, their very core, different values that will create the will to solve these problems that you've just identified? Oh, I definitely think you can have different values. I mean, generationally, clearly that's the case. I mean, millennials have very different values and the generation that 
you know, preceded them. And if you've ever talked to someone from the, you know, Gen Z, it's like talking to someone from another planet sometimes. So, yes, and I'm I not agree. even, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm 33 and I, when I have conversations with an 18 year old, I mean, literally sometimes I don't understand what they're talking about. And it's not like I'm 40 years older than them. I'm, you know, 12, 15 years older than them. So, um, so I do definitely think that I don't think it's, you know, look, I mean, everybody is idealistic when they're young until they grow up and they see how, how, uh, cold the world really can be um, and how pragmatic the world really is. It's very different than what you're taught in school, but I definitely think that generationally you can have different values. The question is, and you know, this is what Barack Obama said, how much of it is keyboard activism versus real activism? Mm. So, you know, sending out a bunch of tweets calling whoever Donald Trump an asshole is not brave. You know, it's not, you know, <laughs> it's not brave um, regardless of what you think of Trump. So, you know, the question is, can you organize a political, social, cultural movement to actually make progress in the areas that need to be made, you know, need to be changed, whatever they may be. Um, I mean, I'm not making a political argument. I'm saying we all agree, no matter what, where you are on the political spectrum, that the world is a mess right now. Uh, and things seem to be getting worse in a lot of areas. And there, there needs to be some sort of systematic change to the way that we govern ourselves, govern our lives, govern our societies, use the world's resources. And the question is, you know, I hope my, 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 my idealistic side would say, I hope the activism that we see in the digital community translates into real activism because it needs to translate into real activism. Now, is that going to happen? I don't know. I, nobody knows. And anyone who tells you they do is, is full of it. So I don't know. Nobody knows, but one can hope. And I think we see some encouraging signs. Yeah. That, that's kind of where I net out. I, me too. You know, as a parent, I see it in, in, in my children and um, I do see it close up. And I do see real, you know, obviously not everyone is going to be an, an active person. Um, they might just be advocates for change, but they might be people who just are on the keyboard. But that kind of speaks to human personality too, doesn't it? You know, there are the drivers and <laughs> there are people who are the followers and that's fine. You, you wouldn't want everyone to be a driver to be chaos. But I suppose it's the first time that we've ever seen the word survival tied to values, isn't it? You know, that the survival, our very survival or having any kind of decent quality of life at all really hinges on us changing the way we think at our very core, not necessarily saying the end of capitalism or anything like that, quite the opposite, but, but being a different type of consumer that is permanently and radically changed. Do you feel that, that that's what we're seeing emerging now? I think, I think it is a subset of the population for sure. You know, I think there's a lot of people that are increasingly realizing that the earth's resources are finite and, you know, what's really What's really interesting is when you start to think of Earth as your home. You know, I mean, this is ultimately it's our home. I, I was listening to a talk by um, Elon Musk recently, who and he s said something to that effect that the Earth is our home, but we want to be an interplanetary species. Well, I mean, just imagine you're in space and you're looking at this floating blue rock in an ocean of black. It, that's that's your home, and you know we have to take care of it. Wherever you are on the political spectrum you have to take care of the place you live in and you have to treat it with a minimum amount of respect um, because we're killing it and we know we're killing it. And this goes to what I was talking about earlier, these intractable, you know, these problems, which are not intractable, but we don't solve them. I mean, we've been talking about, you know, Nixon created the EPA, Nixon created the EPA <laughs> and we're now in 2020 and we're debating, you know, is climate change real and are we going to be in the Paris climate accords? I mean, it's insane. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, you know, I think to your question, yes, we see that in a subset of consumers, but it's certainly not um, universally agreed upon. Uh, there, there are a lot of people that don't see it the same way that we might see it. Yeah, I, I must say I, I am gladdened by the, the, the people. I mean, as young as 10, you know, uh, young kids coming through who are just so on the ball. And like you said, it does feel like they come from another planet. Not, not all of them. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day who comes more from the psychological realm and he described a bifurcation of that generation that some are kind of sleepy and they're just on their devices all day and, and just want to lose themselves in that netherworld. And then others are wide awake. You know, they call themselves the woke generation. So it's very interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about your problem solving pragmatism 
uh, falling on uh, uh, people who really do actively care about, you know, seeing change because they're, they're very survival. Whether they have children or not yeah. depends on this. You know, so many of them are saying I'm not having children. And there was a wonderful in interview I heard with Russell Brand and Marianne Williamson where she was saying, no, <laughs> it's like a, a body whose immune system is broken needs the white uh, teeth cells, you know. If you're one of those, have children, replicate, we need you. Uh, <laughs> totally different conversation from overpopulation of the planet, which is less the issue. Yeah. So um, just talking a lot about uh, values, and that seems to be uh, something that interestingly drives us way more than we probably realise. Um, I got you to, uh, or I invited you to do the Magic Triangle quiz, uh, which everyone that I interview I get to, to do, Dom. And uh, so for anyone who hasn't heard this before, is not familiar with it, basically my background's advertising. The scariest moment for me when I was a junior creative was when someone said to me, you know, Janet, come up with an, a good idea, just make sure it's an effing good one and presented me with a blank page. And it scared the bejesus out of me and certainly quelled my creativity. In that fear space, I realised I couldn't be creative at all. And I think so many of us, when we're confronted with our inner selves, uh, we close up because we're scared of what we might discover about ourselves. And yet there's actually nothing to be scared of. It's just that we need a way there that feels safe and guided. So this is just one of the things I've created. It's an app just to help, uh, help us understand, help you understand what it is that's really important to you beyond all the, you know, the bright, shiny objects that we've been brought up to believe are where happiness lies. So what sits beneath that? So, uh, and the end result of that is coming up with something that, Let's say your right brain, if we're going to talk in those terms, and not your left brain, but your right brain is saying that you need right now. So, uh, Dom, I'll share with you what you came up with. Uh, so three core needs. It's like a triangle. And at the base, we have self-control and willpower. And then at the top, we have mindfulness. So according to uh, the triangle, basically, mindfulness is like the cream that's floated to the top of the milk. It's the thing that's most important to you. Um, before we get to that, Don, what I'd like to do is ask you about the other two core needs. Let's start with self-control. Um, and I'll just say too that, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people have gone through this. I've never seen the same combination twice. It's very interesting. Um, so in a sense, this is a little bit like a, um, I, might, I might say it's a bit of a spiritual thumbprint. Let's call it that. So let's start with self-control. Tell me about self-control and why that came up as one of your uh, core needs. Yeah, I, I think if you look at any uh, anything, any form of progress, whether it's um, completing a marathon, losing 50 pounds, quitting smoking, you know, whatever it might be, you, it basically comes down to the same fundamental principle, which is that you need self-control to push off the immediate pleasure for the long-term gain. I mean, any successful person, I mean, that is fundamentally the difference between a successful person and a quote unquote unsuccessful person, depending on how you define that term. But taking the conventional definition, that is what it boils down to. It's there are two people, you know, John and Davey. David comes home and he grabs the chocolate because it tastes good. And he sits on his couch and he watches his favorite television show. Okay, that's fine. He's getting that immediate pleasure right away. The chips, the food, the chocolate and the television, you know, John comes home and he says, I want to get, I, I want that food. I want that. I want to watch my food t-shirt, but I'm going to get on the, you know, I'm whatever it is. I'm going to go read a book. I'm going to watch a documentary. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go do my work, whatever it might be. So you're pushing off the immediate pleasure for the longer term gains. Now at the end of the day, you repeat this exercise hundreds and hundreds of times. Eventually David's going to be overweight, you know, sick, ill, because he's doing this every day. John is, if he continues to do, push it off is going to be, you know, happier, fitter, healthier, more knowledgeable, whatever it might be. So, you know, and it all boils down to self-control. Everything we do in life is try to try to hack self-control. Everything that we aspire to, everything that we do is always about self-control. Um, and so I think we all want more self-control. I'm willing to put it out there and say, I do. Um, and, and that's what it goes down to. It's pushing off that immediate id, to the, the, the Freudian term, that immediate pleasure principle for the long-term gains. And if you sacrifice the immediate pleasure and you push that off, you ultimately get the greater pleasure in the long run, which is health, happiness, success, I mean, whatever it might be. So that's why I put it down. 
Yeah, okay, thanks for that. And you mentioned being able to say no to the idiot pleasures. What do your idiot pleasures tend to be? Uh, I mean, pretty unoriginal, but it's basically what, you know, in the example I gave, you know, the coming home after a long day and saying, man, I just want to get a bowl of, you know, uh, chocolate chips and lay on the couch with my puppy and watch, you know, watch the yeah. Lakers play or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I think, you know, you know, and you, you really do have to, you know, you really do have to fight against that. I mean, I certainly do. I mean, it's tempting to come home after, you know, working 14 hours in the office, you know, 30 meetings that day, 20 calls, whatever it might be. You want to get that bowl of chocolate or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, uh, you know, the burger and fries, whatever you hit up in and out on the way home, you want to get it and you want to sit in front of your TV and hang out for a couple hours. There's nothing wrong with doing that. I don't want you to think there is, but you doing it repeatedly, Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're giving into this id, this, this, you know, pleasure principle right away. And you're going to suffer long-term for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I, yeah. So what I'm hearing is it's going for the longer term gain. I imagine because that makes you feel better as well, doesn't it? You know, uh, a, a little bit of short-term pain, but the long-term uh, gain. Um, could we put a framework of, uh, you don't want to punish yourself. There's a, there's a fine line, isn't there, between... No, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not punishing yourself, but I mean, yeah. ultimately, we all want what... The, the people who get the long-term gains, everybody wants those things. If you, if you go, you know, nobody says, oh, I want to be, you know, extremely unhealthy... Um, you know, out of shape, miserable, depressed, um, you know, I know, nobody says that, but if you repeatedly give in to your basic primal instincts yeah. to do the thing, to, to do the things that will lead you there, well, that's where you're going to end up. Yeah. And, and, and this is true for everybody. And so it's not about punishing yourself. I mean, sure. I sit on the couch sometimes and I watch the Lakers. Like, of course, everybody, you know, relaxes and I relax as much as the next, well, I don't relax that much, but I, I, you know, in theory I do. So, so the, but the point is, is that, yeah. you know, it's not about punishing yourself at all. There's, I don't think there's anything, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I don't want to be sanctimonious. I don't think there's anything virtuous no, no, no. about punishing yourself, but yeah. I, yeah. but I do think that putting off, you know, I do think that putting off the immediate gains for the long-term goals are ultimately what yeah. will make someone quote unquote successful. Yeah, that's right. Um, and also, if you're really, you know, doing what you are passionate about, I know that um, I used to fall into the self-soothing space, you know, after life, after a day of sacrifice, it'd be a glass of wine or three at the end of the day. Um, and that was, uh, if I'd been more aware at the time, I would have questioned, why am I doing that? What am I trying to numb myself from? So, okay. So uh, thanks for that, Dom. Uh, so self-control is uh one of the legs, if you like, at the bottom of the triangle. Now, willpower, um, tell me about that. And how is willpower different from self-control? I'm interested in that one. And what does willpower mean to you? Well, they are, they are brothers and sisters, <laughs> conceptually. Yeah. But willpower is a little bit different because, you know, I read this interesting book about this concept of willpower depletion, which is very interesting. So if you use willpower in one area, you actually deplete it in another area. It's very fascinating. So they ran this study with dogs where they would bring a dog in and they would put food in front of the dog and they would tell the dog he can't eat the food basically. And they would bring another dog in and they would let the dog go and have the food, right? And so one dog was exercising all this willpower to not eat this food and the other dog was allowed to eat the food. And then they gave the dog a series of commands, sit, get down, stay, roll over. And the dog that you know, was, was, had to exercise that willpower wasn't completing the tasks and they've replicated this with humans and so forth. So you, the willpower depletion is a real thing where if you, you know, if you, if you exercise every single day, you probably are not going to be putting in the long hours at, at the office and vice versa. If you're working, if you're burning the midnight oil at the office, you're probably not hitting the gym afterwards. So it, you know, willpower is in a sense finite. Um, and I'm fascinated by that because if you can figure out a way to balance your willpower just enough optimally in each area, imagine how much progress you could make. So you, mm -hmm. you make just enough progress at work to continue to push your venture forward. You make just enough progress at the gym to continue to hit the goals you want to hit your health, whatever. It, it, it's a, it's, it's like a science actually. And I don't know if you can measure it like that. And maybe it's a fantasy of mine, but I'm fascinated by that concept. So that, yeah. that's why I put willpower down. Yeah, no, I'm fascinated too. It's so, it's uh, it's so different. I'm really interested in it. 
Um, okay, thank you for that. And now the next one, of course, is mindfulness, right? Again, that's a word that's got so many different meanings. So tell us what it means to you, why that was the one that, that rose to the top, Don. I mean, the, the best quote, I one of the best quotes I've ever heard is, wherever you go, there you are. So uh, I think it was John kabat who said it, but I mean, just think about that. Wherever you go, there you are. Very simple, but super interesting if you think about the meaning behind that. We spend, I spend, we all spend so much of our lives not present. And, and I know that you're, you know, people who are listening to this are going to say, I've heard this before, but actually think about what that means. Like how much of your day is spent projecting what you're going to do later in the day or tomorrow or your next call, your next meeting, your next week. And how much of your day has been thinking about, Oh, the past. Oh, I should have done that. I should have done this. I did not right. You spend so much of your life in the past and the future. We miss what's happening right here in front of us. Many of us do. And that is super interesting. Um, I, I'm you know, absolutely a victim to that. I mean, I've literally spent whole days where I'm like on autopilot and I'm, I'm like, what did I do today? You know, just because the whole day I was just meeting, call, meeting, call, meeting, call, and on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. And then you realize like, wow, I wasn't present, you know, for anything today. I, I, I'm missing the most amazing part of my life. I'm like a, I'm like a passenger in my own journey and I'm not even present to enjoy it. You know, the, the, there's the other famous saying, um, you know, the journey is the destination. And so I think being mindfulness for me is the ability to slow down considerably and intensely focus on the present moment. And it's very hard. It's very, very hard. I mean, try to do it later tonight. Your mind is going to wonder, you're going to be like, what am I doing tomorrow? What am I doing later? What oh, I should have done that differently earlier today. Very, very difficult. Think about how sad that is. It's hard to live in the present moment. Um, but if you can do it, it becomes incredibly incredibly introspective, incredibly interesting. You start to notice things like, oh, I never noticed my curtains were white. I, I can't believe I've lived here for 10 years. I never noticed that. And oh, I never noticed that my dog has that spot on the back of his head. That's really interesting. But when you slow down, you live in the present moment, you start to notice all these peculiarities and it's um, a very interesting exercise. So that is what it means to me. Yeah, it's really relevant too, because all our discussion, a lot of it's been on the future. Uh, is it going to be a, you know, a dystopian one or not a utopian one, but, you know, or, a, you know, a, where there is quality of life and accordingly that can create a sense of urgency. And, you know, when we talk about ticking clocks, that doesn't lead, it's, lead us to being present, does it? It leads us into a state of pretty much permanent anxiety where we're constantly yeah. <laughs> on alert, yeah. you know, at a level that is not natural and not how the human species was originally designed. You know, we're in fright, flight or freeze mode pretty much all the time instead of on rare, yeah. rare, ex rare exceptional circumstances. And I, I'll just share with you something that's really worked for me on that. And I wonder if mindfulness is the wrong word because, again, we're going back to the mind. The mind is the source pretty much. It's our fear factory. It's the thing that keeps us in that anxious state. What's worked for me, rather than stilling my mind, is focusing on my heart. Um, the Egyptians used to call the heart our brain, our real brain. So they would, you know, they would uh, basically pull someone's brain out through their nostrils when they're preparing the body, but they would preserve the heart because they saw the heart is where someone's soul was contained. And um, just so just by the by, what's really slowed me down is focusing on my heartbeat. And, uh, and mm -hmm. thinking about my uh, thinking about my heart and where that that's actually the source of my power rather than my mind, which has really changed things for me. That's just my personal um, reflection on that. But what I'm hearing from you there is that it is really about being present and conscious of yourself in this moment. Is that right? So just just enjoying. Yeah, no, I mean, you're this, exactly right. This split second. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, what you said is exactly, I, I, I was inarticulate, but, you know, not uh, living in the past and um, living in the future creates anxiety because mm. you're constantly living in a state of um, uh, not being mindful, <laughs> so to speak. So, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think, you know, that's right. You, you are an amazing futurist. I mean, you are. That's who you are. So that comes with a price in a way, and that's why mindfulness has come up for you as such an important need, because you are driven to solve problems 
a problem exists now, the solution lives in the future. So you can't help but take the problem solve and go, that's what, that's what it could be like. <laughs> so right. you have to know that that's almost in your, in your DNA, Dom, and that that's okay. You don't want to change that. There's nothing wrong with that. that that's who you are. That is actually your gift. But our gift can make big demands of us, that's all. And you absolutely must express your gift because the world needs more people like you. But, but what you're feeling is the, the price of the gift right now. And so it's like, okay, right. that's me. <laughs> can I haul myself right. back from the future for a few precious moments and give myself this gift in the name of divine selfishness? Because if I am not divinely selfish, the world's not going to benefit from my gifts anyway. So that's what I'm, I hear your soul <laughs> is saying. It's asking you to do that, uh, not for any other reason than you're going to be more effective that way doing that. So, okay, so thank you for sharing those three things. Now let's look at how they work. So the, the magic triangle speaks to our inner self first, um, coming from the inner self. And it's funny how this works, but pretty much always um, seems to articulate both your vision and your mission. So let's define your vision as your why, uh, what's uh, really th the most important thing for you, what gets you out of bed, and let's talk about then also how you go, how you go about achieving it. And so in the, this is the most simple mission statement in the world, right? So essentially it's just through self-control and willpower, I achieve mindfulness. So mindfulness is like your Rosetta Stone. It sits out there like the thing that challenges you more than anything, and maybe that's because... In your heart of hearts, you know that's where your creativity lies. In those moments that you can take off and just be suspended in the now is where imagination starts to blossom and where imagination blossom is the, is the playground of problem solving, isn't it? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. so, so imagine that that's, that's you, the real you saying to you, uh, slow down however you do that, whatever way you find to do that, because that's where my creative source, uh, that's where my creativity comes from. That's the source of it. And that's how I'm going to be happy in the future because I am a problem solver. That's what I'm here to do. That's what I was put on this planet to do. And this is why the way to get there is through self-control and, and willpower. In other words, it has to be a conscious act that I engage in. Does that make sense? It, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. And what's at stake is lack of mindfulness, which we'll go to in a moment. Okay, so that's the inner world. The outer world, what's interesting, when you can actually achieve this, so if you can achieve this at your age, you know, hats off to you or caps off, because this is something that most of us don't really become aware of until much, much later in our lives, uh, when the pain has become so great that we have to figure out who we are. But if you can solve this in yourself, then basically what you give to yourself is what you have to give to others. So let's say that mindfulness the ability to imagine, create, and problem solve is not only something that you allow yourself the space to do, but it's also what you will inspire others to do. Does that make sense? That if you're out there as a very mm -hmm. visible problem solver, you're going to inspire a whole bunch of other people to think imaginatively, creatively, and see a problem as an opportunity. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's basically your why. You know, Simon Sinek talks about the why, but so many of us go, yeah, but what does that actually mean? So that's what it means. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's your why in a moment. Your what is your willpower. So what you give to others um, ultimately when you achieve this for yourself is what you also have to share with the world. So in other words, you become a demonstration of willpower. And again, it's probably through ins inspiring others through your own leadership, you know. Um, so the willpower to not only keyboard um, advocate, but to actually create change, to actually see change happen. So that's the what. So I'd be interested to see how that actually plays out in your life going forward, how, that, how, you, how you give the gift of willpower to others. Maybe you'll come up with a way. You were kind of talking about that. You're almost coming up Maybe. with a formula. <laughs> no, exactly. What if you could come up with a formula for um, uh, enabling people to access their willpower at a conscious, in a conscious way? <laughs> Um, that would that would be incredibly incredibly cool, and I would want to use it for myself. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, anything that you want for yourself tends to be what you know. You give the gift at Christmas that you want for yourself. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. much what this is saying. Totally. That's that's the thing for you that you want to be able to create uh, something that will allow people to access their willpower because you're so frustrated at hearing the talk and not seeing any walk. 
Um, and then how you do that, the how is the self-control. So again, it's by mindfully reining yourself in so that you can uh, focus on the job at hand and uh, forget the, 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 the trivial temptations that are out there. But, you know, over time, I think they're probably the side effect and symptoms of a life that's half lived. So if you stay on this path, I, don't, I think that's going to be a less of an issue for you. But that's kind of your how. And again, that's something that you can impart on others, um, how to uh, control yourself so that you don't go and do, you know, there's been a whole generation that's been addicted to video games, for instance. That's the pain. That's the pain that society's feeling right now. You're the problem solver that solves the pain. You know, you're the, the emotional doctor out there going, okay, self-control's an issue. We've seen how devastating it has been for a whole generation, turning them into zombies. This is what we're going to do about it. And you could actually come up with something that solves that. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it does. All Definitely right. makes sense. It's very yeah. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's just, we're just going to do one more exercise here to safeguard what you have because the reason that these are needs is because uh, they're partly outside of you right now. In other words, it's not something that you're aiming towards, not something that you embody, but they will ultimately become your values. They'll be your highest values. They'll be what you stand for. Um, so living a life of integrity is staying true to these core needs and fulfilling them. So the one thing that we have to look at is what could actually sabotage you in achieving these core needs. And we could do this exercise on all three, but we'll just do it on the first one, willpower, because that's the one that sits at the top of the triangle. And so I want you just to imagine that willpower sits out on your right-hand side, not willpower, sorry, mindfulness sits out on your right-hand side as the North Star, you know, as the thing that uh, that is so important to you. And let's say it's because it is that space where you are problem solving that allows you just that extra 10 minutes that you might spend in that space, being fully present you know, wherever you go, there you are. That's the space of creativity and imagination and problem solving. So that is really your lifeblood, right? That's that's what you want. You didn't get that in Wall Street. You were just hitting keyboards. Okay, now flip 180 degrees because what we want to look at is what is the what is the lack that created the need for mindfulness? Okay, so in the same way that a long a long cold winter creates a thirst for summer. So you have the thirst for mindfulness, but what created that thirst in the first place? So if you go 180 degrees to your left-hand side and you look at, well, what's the opposite to mindfulness? What word comes up for you, Dom? Kind of anarchy. Mm. I, I might say anarchy. Yeah, as in a personal anarchy, yeah. like an internal anarchy? Yes, like a system of sort of organized chaos. With Yeah. With, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. And what's so bad about that? I, I think a lot of people exist in that state, uh, you know, where you are living your life on kind of a little bit on autopilot um, and not really thinking about the things you're doing or not doing. And it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like just a chaotic existence in your head. And then when you can really focus on the present moment and be introspective and think, why am I the way I am? Why is this the way it is? You start to really get some interesting answers. So um, yeah, that's how I would define it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you with that state of inner anarchy, you're not really able to problem solve the same way as you could when you're in a state of mindfulness. Is that right? You're uh, and a lot of people live in that state. I think you're just unaware. It's random unaware. Okay. Unaware. And I think what's you're so just bad unaware. About, what's so bad about being unaware? Well, there's a well-known saying that ignorance is bliss. And yet, and yet, I imagine if I lined up 10 people and asked them, something really bad is about to happen tomorrow. Would you want to, would you want me to tell you about it right now? I bet you nine out of 10 people would say yes. Even though ignorance really is bliss. I mean, those people could go home not knowing what's going to happen. And so they're in a state of, ignorant blissfulness but we all secretly want to know what's about to happen even if it's terrible we want to know um and so i think being unaware is a state of blissful ignorance but i don't think we really want that and i and i really think that if you did the exercise i just said i think most people would say no no i want to know what's what what's hap what's what tell me about this bad thing that's about to happen i want to know so i think yeah. we do want to know and i think yeah. living in a blissful ignorance is fun in the short term and not fun in the long term yeah so thank you for that. And what would happen if then, therefore, if you didn't know what, the, what was around the corner, what the future held, held, what would be so bad about that? Yeah, I mean, I think you would live in this blissfully ignorant state 
which I think is pleasant to an extent, but I think human beings have a need and, and a innate curiosity to explore and understand and look at our species, look at the evolution of our species going back, you know, 250,000 years to the first homo sapiens to where we are today. I mean, we're going to, we're about to be on Mars. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we collectively have this human interest in exploring, learning, understanding. And I think being in a state of blissful ignorance is, is only doable in the short term. I mean, even if you are taking a biblical uh, lens to this, Right. Um, you know, Adam bites the apple. Right. And, and all of a sudden is aware that he's naked in the Garden of Eden and is aware that of, of the world and, and its present self. So he's in that blissfully ignorant state. He has this yearning to take this apple. He's tricked right by the snake, he takes the apple. And then all of a sudden he sees the world as it is. So, you know, going back to any parable, going back to the evolution of our species, clearly there's a theme here. We want to know. Uh, we want to explore, we want to understand, we have the curiosity, we want to know. So yeah, you can be blissfully ignorant and that'll take you only so far until eventually, you know, you're really going to want to seek, seek out something more than that. Yeah, absolutely. And for you, what's so scary, Dom, about not knowing? It's, it just creates an, 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 an unease, you know, um, when you don't know. I mean, very few times in life is it beneficial to not know something. Very few times. If you really, you know, try to challenge yourself to think, when would it be beneficial for me not to know something? It might be beneficial, you know, to not know if you had like a terrible illness so you could live your life in sort of a fun way until you pass away. I mean, there are circumstances where it might be good to not know, but they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. In general, you you want to know, and I think I'm no different. I, I do want to know, but again, it, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I do want to know. I, I totally get that. So I want you to go to the flip side of that because this is where we have to go, right? This is the scary part. This is the fear. We're looking at the fear that sits behind uh, being unaware. What What is scary or what's bad about being unaware? What might happen about not knowing? What could happen to you? I mean, you know, everything from a minor inconvenience to something, you know, you could lose your life. <laughs> so to the, you pay the ultimate price. Yeah. Okay. All right. So excellent. So we've gone from mindfulness on the one hand to basically fear of death on the other. Right. So, so what we need to know when we have a core need is it's driven by a core fear and we have to know what that fear is in order to preserve the core need to make it happen. Because if we run away from our fear, uh, you know, the old story, when you, whatever you run away from comes to greet you. And so that's, that's the insight, if you like, that that fear of annihilation or however you want to call it, fear of death, sits behind that need for mindfulness. Does that make sense? So, so let's say need for mindfulness might, might be you at your most alive, at your most present, where you are you. And behind that is that, that fear of the void of nihilism, of death, of not being here anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, it does. And I think... I suspect most people have that fear in some sense. I mean, I don't think about it on a daily basis, obviously, but I think conceptually everybody has some level of that fear not of not yeah. being here, so to speak. Yeah, that definitely. Yeah. Well, we have different fears and they tend to be primal. So let's just say there are three primal fears. Um, that one is rejection. So that's a big, big fear, very common. You know, I'm not loved. I'm not wanted. Uh, one is scarcity, not having enough, and that can certainly lead to uh, death. And the other one is not being safe around safety. So these are primal fears that have come through our system uh, epigenetically, you know, being passed on through the generations. So the key here is, mm -hmm. um, is understanding what uh, the fear is and then the thing that's trigger triggering that fear, the story, whatever that story is. That's not for this podcast, but that's the journey to find out what the – the, the negative narrative or what I call the core destructive belief, because I believe or I, I have evidence to prove that there is just one story that underpins all our limiting beliefs. If we can bring that to the surface, then we can tame that fear. So uh, thank you for uh, taking part in that exercise. Did you, did you find that interesting? Did you get sure. something of value from that? What did you learn from that, Don? Yeah, yeah, no, it was very interesting. I liked, um, well, I just, it forced you to, you know, pick the three aspirational values that you're you want more of in your life and i thought that was a good exercise in you know 
narrowing it down and being able to make those hard choices. You know, oftentimes we're not forced to pick and we were in this instance, I was forced to, I think we started with 15 and then seven and then three. And I like the idea of saying, Oh, okay. That actually, that is not that important to me, or I already have that. And so eventually you get to the three where you're like, Oh, those really are the three that matter. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah. Well, if you like, in, in a way, metaphysically at, at, at least, you know, if death is living in, is working in Wall Street, you're, it is a life or death choice for you. And that really staying in that space of creativity and problem solving is the essence of you. And that's where you just need to focus. So creating the environment around your day to day living that allows you to do or you just make that happen because that's uh, that's your big, big driver. And, uh, and also the world needs you and the world needs people like you to be the pragmatists who are going out there leading the charge going, this sucks, this is, going, this, this is broken, we need to do something about it. So um, before we, we wind up, Dom, um, I'm going to hand back to you just to, to say, um, uh, you know, maybe to the, let's, let, what about a message to the cynics and skeptics out there who might be saying, you know, uh, profit and purpose, uh, Oil and water, never supposed to mix. What would you like your parting words to those people to be? Uh, My parting words would be, you should come out from the rock you've been hiding under the last 10 years, because if you look around you, profit and purpose is literally everywhere. It's the new form of capitalism. It's probably going to save our entire species and our world. Uh, There's no reason to be cynical about it at all. I think even the most... uh, (laughs) I don't want to say evil, but even the most nefarious people on some level can, can understand profit and purpose at its most basic level. And it's probably the way of the future. So I would say, don't be cynical about it. Keep an open mind, look around you. You'll see it everywhere. Um, it's, it really is, I think the future of capitalism in this country, certainly, and hopefully for the world. And I think it can solve critically solve some of the problems that exist out there. And I'm going to do my small part to kind of push things forward. Dominic, thank you so much. I'm sure you will. I know you're going to do that. And it's been an absolute um, pleasure and delight um, having this conversation with you. So thank you for uh, appearing on Wake the F Up. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was really, really interesting. Most interesting podcast interview I've done in a while, and I've done quite a few. So this was great. Thanks for the opportunity. Learned a lot about myself. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking again. You have just listened to another enlightening episode of Wake the F Up with Janet Hogan. To find out more about the breakthrough guided way to get off the hamster wheel and seize a life of freedom and fulfillment, visit JanetHogan.com slash podcast for access to the show notes and to learn more about Janet's breakthrough work. Just remember, finding your true path isn't potluck. It's a process. Until next time. 